My name is Dylan. I won't tell you exactly how old I am, but I will tell you that I was on vacation from college back in 1978. Yeah, I know, I'm ancient, right? Well, trust me, I feel it every single day. Now, I know the greater part of you won't have memories of 1978. Indeed, most of you probably hadn't even been born yet. So let me tell you about the summer of 1978. It was simultaneously one of the best times of my life, and also one of the scariest. I was from East Tennessee. I had grown up a poor farm boy with seven siblings, four brothers, and three sisters. We were what they used to call stair-step kids. You know, one of us was born about every two years. Of course, we didn't line up and stand still much except on Sundays. We were on our best behavior on Sundays, or Mama would have whipped us with a limb from the nearest maple tree. She was little, but she was fierce. I guess she had to be to take care of all of us kids way out in the middle of nowhere. My father, Pop as we called him, seemed to always be gone to work. Again, I guess it was a have-to situation. He had to earn enough money to support his extra-large family. Anyway, before I get to waxing poetic about my youth, let me get to the heart of it. We were dirt poor. I didn't know a way through life that didn't include working hard and struggling harder just to keep a little food on the table. We had bad times when we all went hungry. There were times when I thought winter would never end, and I'd never be warm again. And no matter how many blankets we piled on us, that drafty old house was cold as a witch's tit every winter. If we got sick, which wasn't as often as you might think under the harsh conditions, we didn't go running to the doctor. No, there wasn't enough money for that. We relied on Mama's knowledge and a whole lot of luck to get better. For us farm kids, school was pretty much optional, but I liked school. Even though I was teased relentlessly and didn't have food for my lunch 90% of the time. My clothes were ragged, weren't much use for new jeans every year when you were going to be working on the farm. And by the time I reached 7th grade... I had grown to loathe the looks of pity from the teachers. Although I was a straight A-B student, they still gave me those looks of sympathy because I was just so damn poor. You know, they treated me differently too. They talked to me like I was a mentally handicapped toddler most of the time. I'd go home some afternoons and work behind a shovel or pitchfork until bedtime just to get rid of the stress of it all. Nevertheless, I understood as early as the fifth grade that if I ever wanted a different life, a better life, school was my ticket. So I stayed with it. I stuck out the bad times and faced the hopeless horror of being the poorest of the poor kids, with my head held high and my shoulders squared. You see, I was the only one in that shit poked town that knew I wasn't going to be poor forever. By the time I graduated high school, Mama was worn down and aged beyond her years. She was proud of me for staying in school even though Pop had lost interest in me and my schooling by my freshman year. You often told my brothers I was a lost cause and that I was determined to undermine the only way of life I had ever known. He was often quick to tell me that I would regret turning my back on him and the farm life one day. I wasn't turning my back on him, or the farm, but he couldn't see that, or maybe he just wouldn't see that. Mama and my youngest sister were the only family who attended my graduation. I worked hard, I really did, and I stayed my course. And back then, the money to go to college was almost impossible to come by, but there were ways to get in if you had the grades, and well... I had the grades. I had spent my life making sure that I had them. One of my teachers helped me, probably out of pity, 
uh, to procure a scholarship. And when I went to college in North Carolina, I had a room, a job, and a head full of dreams. Two years later, I was tired, but still excited about learning, about finding a better way to live. My way was going to be research and study the towns of people of the Appalachian Mountains. My professor had told me the best way to really learn about anything was to submerse myself into it. And so, in the summer of 1978, that's just what I planned to do during my summer holiday. I would go back home, see some of the family for a few days, and head off into the lesser traveled parts of the mountains to just roam and learn. Now, I had been a curious critter my whole life. Mama was forever pulling me out of places I shouldn't have been in to start with when I was a kid. And Granny called it curious. Grandpa called it spitfire and hell in the body of a kid. He said I was a holy terror as a kid. He never knew what I was going to take apart or which rabbit hole I was going to try to crawl into. Granny said I was a treasure, that my natural curiosity and energy just meant I was smart. I just wish that they had lived to see me graduate high school, though. But life expectancy back then was much shorter than it is today. Times were tougher, the world colder and more brutal out in the sticks than anywhere else. But understand this. You see, that burning desire to learn more, to know more, and to experience more, caused me the most horror of my life that year. There was a sort of town way up in Flag Pond that I wanted to explore. I'd always heard tales about the people up there, but I had only ever gone there twice, and both times before I was ten. The place made a big impression on me as a kid. Devil's Fork, it was called. Now, it's just a road name, but back then Devil's Fork was the community itself, not just the road. Though it's only a few miles from the town of Irwin, Flag Pond seems like it's days away from civilization as you drive up the mountain on the ever-steepening grade of S-curves. If you take some of the sharp curves fast enough, I swear you'd be able to see your own ass going round the bend. Now The mountain rises steep, growing out of the ground and a couple feet beyond the pavement. Well, it soars up into the sky and makes you feel really small. It puts you in your place. And on the left side, for most of the way, there's a drop-off to the river. The mountain is farther away on that side, but it still rises up, and you're completely surrounded by nature. Even with that paved road, it almost seems untouched by time. I drove to the road and took the right-hand turn with my heart beating just a little faster. Devil's Fork didn't just feel untouched by time and isolated. It was. There was no motel or any rooms for rent up on that part of the mountain. Not back then, anyway. But I was happy to sleep in my old Ford. It was at least less drafty than the house I grew up in and the seat was softer than my bed had been too. And being summer, I wouldn't have to worry about being cold. Hell, I was young, and I was ready to take on the world. The mountain grew from both sides of the road, and its craggy sides were jagged with huge rocks. Mostly jack pines grew up near the tops, giving the heights a ragged, chewed look. Not the pretty, soft edges of the green-blue mountains of Irwin and Flag Pond that looked for the world like a gently rolling ocean. No. You see, nothing about Devil's Fork was soft or gentle. Not when I was a kid, and not when I returned as a grown man. The community was spread out on the mountain on both sides of the road. Neighbors weren't in close proximity to each other either. Yards were made up of immovable boulders and rocks. The small farm fields were interrupted with outcrops, and the mountainsides behind the houses sported caves, some only small indentations, and others so large that no one knew exactly how far under the mountain they went. 
the grocers sold their goods from a portion of their house. And farther up, a garage had been converted into a sort of a neighborhood bar and grill. And I went there first to feel out the receptiveness of the locals. Back in the day, the people up there were not fond of outsiders. An outsider was anyone who had not grown up there and who did not currently live there. And as recent as the 90s, cops refused to cruise up Flag Pond even on routine patrols. It just wasn't safe. And the locals had made sure the cops knew how dangerous it was. You know, there's no telling how many people have disappeared off the face of the earth, never to be seen again up there around Flag Pond. I wasn't there to stick my nose in anyone's personal business, or to rile up any angst. I just wanted to talk to people who were willing to show me around, tell me about life up there, and maybe show me a few things firsthand. The Grease Pit, well, <laughs> It was a terrible name for a diner or a grill, in my opinion. Nevertheless, I parked the Ford and got out to stretch my legs. There was only one other car there, an ancient 1930s Studebaker dictator. I looked in the windows as I walked by the car. There were pink knitted seat covers. I kind of chuckled at that. It was a woman's car for certain. Pale pink ribbons hung from the side mirrors in the bar that supported the headlights. They stuck out because the car was a lighter shade of army green, the ugliest color ever. The breeze that seemed to never die down made the ribbons wave as if there were little arms and hands inviting me closer. Before I realized I was getting closer, I was a foot from the side mirror, peering at the odd ribbon. Somebody had decorated it with arcane symbols from one end to the other, all the ribbons carrying the same writing. Now, I thought it was odd, but those people lived differently than us lowlanders. They surely had different views on religion and the world at large. So, I let it be and walked on into the grease pit. A man wearing a stained apron and a white t-shirt in worse shape than the apron greeted me with a grunt and a nod. He eyed me up and down with a disdainful look, shook his head, and walked toward the kitchen. I knew it was only because I was an outsider. An old woman sat at the back of the little dining room at the table meant for two. She muttered to herself and took a bite of bread. Her eyes darted around the room restlessly, her gaze barely slowing when it landed on me. As she looked out the grimy window, a small smile crossed her face, and then her brows wrinkled together and she shook her head. She mumbled, No, no, no. He don't need to know none of it. I wouldn't believe it anyway, no good. Her gaze flitted toward me and then passed as she turned back to her plate of bread. Putting on my most charming smile, I sat at the table next to her, facing her. She stopped muttering and kept her head turned toward the window. She wore a pink knitted old lady's cap, even though it was midsummer and much too warm for a knit cap. I looked from the Studebaker outside the window and then back to her. She looked too old and frail to be driving the car. Now, after several minutes, the cook came out to me and asked what I'd like. I ordered only coffee, and then snorting his displeasure, turned away. No one joined the pink cap lady, and I was intrigued by the idea of that woman driving alone, so I had to find out. I waited for my coffee and watched as the woman ate piece after piece of cornbread. She ate as if she hadn't eaten in a long time and by her whip-thin stature, that would be easy to imagine. She couldn't have weighed more than 90 pounds fully clothed and soaking wet. My coffee arrived several minutes later, and it was only lukewarm, so much for southern hospitality. That commodity must have been in short supply. I drank half the cup, working up my nerve to speak to the woman. I didn't want to be rude and interrupt her meal, though. 
She muttered to herself again and was in the middle of vehemently declining some imagined invitation when I decided to leave her alone. Bits of cornbread flew from her mouth as she proclaimed, He's no good to you, no! Now shocked at her outburst, I looked down at my coffee. She stood abruptly, her cup clattering against the now empty plate. I glanced up as she moved toward me and saw she wore a handful of those pale pink ribbons with the same writing on them. A key dangled from one. Her gnarly aged hand snaked up and took a hold of it, and she yanked that ribbon over her head. Two others were caught up and came off, falling to the floor behind her. She stopped at my table and glared at me. I was wide-eyed and I stared up at her. Just as I started to apologize for absolutely no reason other than the glare she was giving me, she held up the key. In a gruff, raspy voice, she asked, You want to drive me to the house, boy? I stammered, unsure what to say. Was she some mad woman who roamed the mountains picking up strangers? Some behaviors ignored by locals seemed terrifyingly odd to outsiders. Now I knew this, but to be the outsider and not know how to respond to such actions had me at a complete loss. She shook the key violently in front of me. Well, I ain't got all day. She dropped the key in my lap and started for the door. I picked up the two fallen ribbons and clutched them in my hand with the key. I tried to ask the cook about it, you know, how to respond to the woman, but he glowered at me and shrugged. You walk in here like you had the world by the ball, Sonny Jim. You figure it out. He took my money and didn't even offer me the change back. Nodding, I went to the woman's car. She had climbed into the passenger seat and sat ramrod style, her dark eyes still darting around as if she were trying to see everything all at once. I held out my hand and tried to give the ribbons and key back, but she ignored me. I looked at her amazed. I wondered if I should even do it, you know, drive her home. She was tiny and posed no threat to me at all, even if she had a gun or a knife and tried to kill me. I just couldn't see her succeeding. But you know what? That's what I was up there for after all. To immerse myself in the day-to-day -day life of the unexplored communities of the Appalachians. Now, I began to see it as a gift, you know, a sign that I was on the right path in life. And so I climbed under the wheel and started the car. You'll have to show me the way, I told her. She pointed up the road. She lived farther up the mountain, at least I hoped. If she had dementia or something... I might end up in another state. I didn't know where the road ended. It was an adventure, I thought, lightening up just a little bit. Now, the Studebaker didn't even 20 miles per hour if I pushed it hard. Laughable, really, but it gave me time to take in the scenery. About two miles up the road, the woman turned to me, training that glare on me. You're wanting stories about the old days and old ways up here, aren't you, boy? I was stunned, and I finally nodded and asked how she knew that. Well, it don't matter. You were going to sleep in that truck, but you can't. You'll stay at my place while you're here. I'll tell you all the stories you want. She smiled slyly and added, I'll show you things like you ain't never seen, too, boy. Now, I didn't decline, but I never accepted her invitation either. She pointed to a driveway on the right side of the road, and I maneuvered the car into a badly rutted dirt road. I couldn't imagine her driving on that, or driving at all for that matter. Even slowing to a crawl, some of the bumps in the road rattled my teeth together. She sat perfectly straight and silent with her hands folded in her lap. The driveway was impossibly long, and I thought the house would never come into view. And I had begun to think she had pointed out the wrong road, that it was perhaps an old logging road. 
and looking to her for assurance was no good. She just sat there like a damn statue. And then finally, the house came into view, rising up out of the landscape as we drove up the hill. It was a gothic-style four-story, with a widow's walk on one side. The back of the house was extremely close to the craggy mountainside. I mean, the back porch was literally only six or seven feet away from the sharp incline of the mountain. She got out as soon as I put on the brake and motioned for me to follow her. I caught up to her and tried to hand her the ribbons and the key again. She took the key ribbon, but put it over her head, and then took the two ribbons from me, and motioned for me to bend down so that she could put them on me. And at that point, well... I just went with it. She told me that they were for protection or something like that. Protection from what? I asked her, following her up the rickety wooden steps of the back porch. She cackled. <laughs> College ain't done you no good, boy. And that stopped me in my tracks. As I watched her open the door and step inside. How the hell... Did she know I went to college? A little spooked and a lot fascinated, I walked toward the door. Before I got there, an icy gust of air billowed around me from the right. I turned toward the mountainside and saw a cave entrance. I hadn't seen it before. Hell, I don't even know how I missed it. The thing was huge. Another icy gust ruffled my hair. A low sound like a low note on a church organ came from the cave. It turned into an almost mournful sound and the hairs on my neck and arms stood up. And just then, the screen door banged and I jumped, spinning to see the woman standing on the porch behind me. She moved quicker than I gave her credit for, and the glare had disappeared, and her eyes were large and round, as if frightened as she looked to the cave. She took me by the arm and led me into the kitchen. A hot cup of coffee and a large slice of apple pie sat on the table. She motioned toward it. Sit, eat, and drink. I'll tell you a story, boy. What kind of a story? I sat eagerly as my stomach rumbled. The pie smelled delicious. A story older than time, older than us, and... Older than the world. She grinned at me. But the grin made my skin tighten. There was more than a hint of madness in that expression. I nodded and turned my attention to the pie and coffee. I listened as she told me a creation story. Not like the one everyone has heard. You know, the one from the Bible. In her story, there was a god of unknowable form. And this god had drifted through the timeless, dark, cold void. There was no way to measure the length of time, because time did not exist for this god. The god grew bored and then tired. And in the void, there was only endless nothingness. Only the god. It fell into a slumber and dreamed the universe into being. Although we, and everything we know, are only projections of that god's dream, we are real. Everything in the universe was made real simply by the dream of this slumbering god. Now I had stopped eating and drinking as I got caught up in the details of her story. I'd read stories similar to hers, but not quite the same. I'd been briefly introduced to the works of H.P. Lovecraft in college, but passed on becoming a serious reader of his work. I preferred non-fiction. The old woman said the god sometimes inserts himself into his own dream. She reiterated several times that he was not a good god. He was not a serene, wise old man with a flowing beard. But a grotesquery beyond all imagining whose greatest pleasure was causing chaos and destruction just to see how his creations handle it. I told her that was a pretty dark take on the world. I chuckled and stood, 
ready to leave and wondering if I was going to have to walk all the way back to the grease pit. She stepped in front of me. I can prove to you it's all real. He's here. He's been here with me for hundreds of years. He keeps me young. Now that was mad talk. I was sure of it. And so I politely declined and headed for the door. But she cackled again. You're dying to know the truth, ain't you? Just too scared to admit it. Pansy boy. What would your pop think? The tone of her voice dropped lower. Do you know me? I asked, creeped out at the information she seemed to know about me. She shook her head, grinning. No, but he does. She pointed toward the cave. He's always known you. He made you. I looked from the cave to her and shook my head. Another cold breath of air whirled around me, but never ruffled the old woman's hair or her billowy thin sweater, even though she stood only two feet from me. The air lifted my hair like ghostly fingers, and then wrapped around my wrists, gently tugging me toward the cave. Startled, I yanked free and sprinted toward the front of the house. I heard the woman telling someone, I told you it was useless. He's scared stupid. He's no good. Reasoning that what I'd felt was impossible, I moved slowly toward the porch to see who she was talking to. She was not there. I heard her voice again and saw that she stood at the entrance to the cave. A thin wisp of a woman who wasn't exactly right in the head, facing the dangers of the cave all alone. My instinct to help her kicked in and I forgot about the spooky wind and her crazy story. I ran toward her, and she disappeared into the darkness of the cave before I could reach her. I stood at the entrance, unable to see anything inside. The wind kicked up outside, blowing hotly against my back as if pushing me to go into the cave. And just then, thunder roared overhead. The sky had been clear and blue only moments before and I looked up to see a mass of rolling, gray storm clouds forming from nothing and blotting out the sun. The thunder rumbled again. It cracked and rolled across the sky slowly. I yelled into the cave, but the woman didn't answer, and lightning split the sky, a thick bolt that split a tree and set fire on the next ridge. I yelled again, telling her it was going to storm and that we needed to get back inside and I hoped she would come to me. From the recesses of the darkness, her voice echoed. I always come in here when it storms. It's safer than the house. Come on, please. I'm afraid by myself. I yelled that I couldn't see, but she only persisted that I joined her. The lightning crashed right in front of the car burning a huge black spot in the thin grass. The clouds burst and hail the size of quarters rained down, bouncing off the rock, battering me, stinging and burning, and I was forced into the cave. Shuffling my feet and keeping my hand on the cold stone wall, I made my way in far enough to avoid being beaten by the hail. I spotted the woman far back into the cave, she had built a small fire, and its sickly orange glow did little to alleviate the blackness. I moved toward the fire. The woman smiled and beckoned to me, and I couldn't help being reminded of a witch from a kid's story, beckoning the wayward child into her deadly snare. The temperature had dropped, and I was shivering. But warily, I walked on. Something large moved just beyond the glow of the fire. I stopped and shielded my eyes, trying to see into that darkness that seemed darker than the rest of the cave. Thinking I was being a nervous Nelly, I moved closer to the fire, shivering almost uncontrollably. Looking into the woman's stretched and fake expression was like looking into pure madness. 
I made up my mind to be off that mountain as soon as the storm passed. I would find myself some other unexplored rural town to immerse myself into. A slithering sound came from the other side of the fire again, and the woman's already stretched smile widened even more. Her eyes grew wide and excited, and I backed away a step, and she darted toward me, reaching for me but not touching me. Stay, stay, stay. It would mean so much to me. I want to be young again so badly, boy. You'd be doing me a favor. She nodded, all of her teeth showing, and her eyes opened so wide they looked as if they were about to pop out of her head. And then the sound came again. It was scales on smooth rock. I'd heard snakes on rock before, but this was hundreds of times larger than any snake. I backed away another step, looking all around for whatever was making that noise. It came from behind me I spun to face the opening of the cave. In the weak light from outside, I could make out a shadow. It twisted and writhed like a snake, but it was as thick as I was tall. The woman squealed and clapped her hands with a look of pure delight on her face. In another shadow the same size came from the opposite side of the cave, and they twined together. I was trapped. I backed toward the fire, terrified out of my mind. None of it could be real, or that's what I kept telling myself anyway. I thought I was hallucinating. You know, sometimes caves that ran deep under the mountains filled with gases that were deadly, that could cause the hallucinations. And I looked to the woman. She was too far gone to help. She had apparently visited the cave and breathed the gases one time too many, and it had driven her batshit crazy. Something so large it seemed to fill the back of the cave began to slide toward the fire, toward the woman, and toward me. She seemed not to notice. Proof it was my overheated imagination making shit up. I mustered all my courage and ran straight for the opening of the cave, certain that I would run right through those writhing shadow shapes. And you can imagine my shock and horror when I collided with them. Immovable, solid, and quite alive. I rebounded and hit the ground on my ass. The shapes moved toward me, a circle of living flesh closing in on me. I tripped over the sticks of the fire and fell again. When I stood, I ran in the opposite direction, and I wish I had never seen what I glimpsed at the back of that cave. It was huge, and beyond my powers of description. There were eyes as large as car tires set on either side of the mass, a cavernous mouth full of rows of sharp teeth. Snake-like tentacles reached out from either side, making a blockade at the entrance and the entire mass pulsated, bulged, and flexed its way closer to me. The breath escaping its mouth was rancid and icy cold, billowing out to caress me like a hundred hands. And the woman crooned, Sleep, boy. Sleep in the embrace of God so that I'll be young again. I did good, didn't I? He fell for the act, hook, line, and sinker. He's good for another renewal, right? Her voice had turned high and screechy. The thing's breath was making me sleepy, and I felt as if I were in a dream, or rather, a nightmare. And everything slowed to a crawl, and the caress of the cold air rocked me gently. My eyes fluttered shut for a moment, and then opened again. If they hadn't, I wouldn't be sharing this story with you now. I'd be dead. A tongue-like protuberance moved toward me from deep within that monster's mouth. Slime dripped from it as it lulled back and forth in the air as if searching for me. I was almost convinced it was a dream until that filthy, dripping tongue was right in front of my face. I shook off the numbness of sleep and stumbled back, flailing my arms. Now spinning... I grabbed two hefty branches from the fire and threw them into the open mouth. The woman screamed as I spun and ran towards the entrance. 
and everything still seemed to happen in slow motion. The two tentacles unfurled and withdrew, one whooshing over my head and the other snagging my foot. I flew forward and hit the ground hard enough to knock the breath from my lungs. The monster screamed, and the outrush of air pushed me out into the pelting hail and rolling down the slope. I crashed into the lattice underpinning of the porch and clawed my way to my feet. The scream came again. The sound rattled the windows of the house and shattered the glass from the old Studebaker. I clamped my hands over my ears and screamed as I ran down the rutted driveway. Now I lost count of how many times I fell before I reached the paved road, and I was too traumatized to care. As soon as my feet hit the pavement, the hail turned to rain and the thunder stopped. The clouds thinned and the sunlight returned. And I ran. I didn't stop running. It was all downhill at that point, so it was easy to keep going. The adrenaline pumped through me strong enough that I could have probably ran all the way back to Mama's house. Wheezing and numb, I stumbled to my Ford and fumbled with the door handle. My hand shook so badly I couldn't get the key into the ignition, and the cook burst out through the door and stalked to my truck. What the hell are you doing back here? You get away? His gruffness had subsided only a little. I stared at him confused. Well, you better run like the wind and you don't stop, boy. You're the only one that ever got away. He surprised me by laughing. Better take off them damn ribbons or she'll find you and drag you back. You see those ribbons call to her because of that damn scribble on them right there. He chuckled again and walked away. I tore the ribbons off and tossed them into the dirt. I broke every speed limit between Devil's Fork and my college and stayed away. And after that, I dropped out of college and took over Pop's farm. It actually grew and became more prosperous than any of us had ever dared to dream. Now I never told anybody about what happened to me up on that mountain. But I figured people should know about it. You see, I don't think I have much time left. I went out to the end of the cornfield to check growth this morning and found a pale pink ribbon hanging from a stalk of corn. <laughs>